Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 7th of February, 2021. Uh, Hello from windy, rock, the windy Rocky Mountains in uh, Utah. We have a special guest today. Hi there. This is Danny. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married for a few years now, and uh, she's joining the conversation today because we have some very important things to talk about um, that she, I think, has some good input on. So let's jump on over to our agenda, and then we'll get started. There we go. Okay, so first up, we're going to do a, what I'm going to call a gear talk, but what I want to talk a little bit about is gear acquisition syndrome and creativity. I don't know if I put it in those terms when we talked about this exactly before. You didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's, I think there's some some interesting things that we can talk about there, and I think you bring a, a variety of perspectives that I think are important to this discussion. And then after we wrap that up, we'll go into our question and answer and actually, what I forgot to put on the agenda there, we do have a couple of microphones to give away later today, which is kind of perhaps ironic given our early on conversation that we're going to have here. So, Oh, it fits right in. You think it fits in? Actually, it kind of does. It, it kind of does. It really does. It's okay. both, both, both. A little bit of each. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about gear acquisition syndrome, first of all. What's your understanding of what gear acquisition syndrome is? I should be asking you that. Because <laughs> I'm... I have a bad case of it, actually. Um, and I and I think that there are, in, in context, you know, if you're going to do reviews, you end up acquiring a lot of gear. Um, but I think it's important to manage it. And I think that kind of the theme I'm hoping to, kind of the thing I've discovered is, if you get buried in gear, there comes a point where it starts to, I think, affect your creativity. Like if you have too many options to choose from, it stifles creativity. I would agree with that. Uh, I think it's good to work on things that you have at the moment and see everything that you can get out of that particular item and really test uh, what its possibilities are. And then also as you get more experience with that, <clears throat> you can investigate other options and see what might work for you. And so you could have a prioritized kind of plan for how you want to handle it. In other words, if things are working well for you with what you have, then that may be a good sign for you to just kind of stay with what you have as opposed to trying every single thing that's out there, which is tempting sometimes. Yeah, for sure. So you will probably have noticed in the last uh, month or so, I guess, maybe month and a half, we've been doing some more giveaways. Part of the problem is that I've got too much stuff here. There's more than I can use. And in fact... Uh, you'll see one of our questions later on. I, I can't answer. I should be able to answer, but I can't answer because we have too many, too many in that case, camera options. And so I haven't had an opportunity to really explore that new camera. So um, I think what I have found is that when you have too much stuff, there is a psychological thing that happens to you, like too much of a certain kind of thing, more than you need, then things start getting crazy. Now, if you're a professional and you're, you know, um, you're making money from shooting and and or recording or whatever it may be, there are there is certainly a case for having more than one microphone, for example. There is a case for having more than one instrument. You have more than one fiddle. I have exactly two. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you tell us? So this is, I think, actually instructive. So why don't you tell us about your two instruments and what the context was for purchasing your second instrument? Sure. I play fiddle and violin, and for years and years and years, probably the first 40 years that I played the instrument, I had just one. Um, and I had friends who would, uh, were kind of questing for a better instrument at all times and would kind of buy a lot of instruments. Um, but I kind of went the opposite direction, feeling like, well, if this instrument works for me, then I'm just going to keep using it. And that worked well for a long time and still I, until I started playing outside. And having just the one pretty nice instrument um, and, and playing outside in iffy weather situations made me really kind of anxious and nervous that I was going to damage it. So I ended up looking around and finding an, a, a relatively inexpensive, actually quite inexpensive, very nice sounding electroacoustic instrument that I feel okay about taking outside, especially if it gets just a tiny bit wet. I mean, I'm not playing in big storms or anything. That's not good for anybody. But 
uh, that actually has really helped me. And, and also it's very portable, so I can take it places and not worry too much about it. So in that case, that I feel like that was a good move for me. And I do play both of them. So if I had gotten another instrument and then one got neglected, which it, that can be relatively easy to have happen, then I might have uh, maybe looked at that decision a little more. But I do play both of them almost every day. Yep. Okay. I think that's a really a great illustration. And, and I think that's really kind of touches on some things that make it the, the evaluation process of what you should have, you know, what you should keep and what you shouldn't. So for example, <laughs> this is pathetic. So I'm, I am confessing now that this is pathetic up ahead of time. Um, I have five, one, two, three, four, five. So five cinema cameras. And before, and, and when the Canon C70 was announced, I said, okay, I have to get rid of one before I can buy the C70. The rea- reality is, is I think five is too many. It's more than I need. Um, there, there was a reason I bought the C70, don't get me wrong, but I think it's still more cameras than I really need. And I think that's that, you know, obviously if you have a, if you have a piece of gear that sit around, that sits around and you use it almost never or never, that's a sign that you probably don't need it. And it, it might be better. It might actually be better for your creativity to sell it or give it to somebody else who can use it. There are some really nice comments in the chat, and I'd like to address a couple of those yeah. if I can. Yeah, which ones? Okay, so Linda Lawson brought up a very uh, important point. Redundancy is not a bad thing when doing pro work. Absolutely. I have some colleagues who are professional fiddle players, and one of the people uh, is a touring musician. Of course, not right now, but um, he has double, he, he uses a lot of effects pedals and things like that, electronics, and whenever you're working with a complicated signal chain, things can get dicey really fast. You know, a wire, a cable can go out or something like that. So he actually has two of everything, you know, a duplicate of of that setup, maybe not the exact same pieces, but so that he can replicate his sound if something goes bad or gets lost or, or something like that. Um, let's see, there was another thing here. I think that was the main thing <laughs> <laughs> as I look at it. But yeah, some really nice comments. Yeah. Um, in regards to the five cameras, so just to to give some background, so we've got the Panasonic GH5, the GH5S. Um, we have the Pocket Cinema Camera 6K, which is the main camera we use for the YouTube videos, not not the live streams, but the produced videos. We have the Canon C200, which is currently we're using as our camera here for the live stream. That was actually purchased for doing corporate work because the Pocket Cinema cameras were not working out well for that from the standpoint that I was a solo operator and I couldn't pull focus when we were doing walk and talk type interviews and stuff like that. So that was kind of the thinking there, but nevertheless that, that, and then now it's basically turned into our live stream show camera and we have the C70. What have I missed? Okay. So those are the five. And then I also have a stills camera, the Nikon. And I, I actually insist that you keep that one right. because it takes really nice photographs. And for those of you who may not know, Curtis actually got started in all this with photography. So that was many, 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 many years ago before we were even married. <laughs> yeah. And then there's always the, the money thing too. Like if, you, if you're always investing in gear, you're not, you're not probably saving as much money as you should be. Or, you know, your business is not necessarily as profitable as it should be. There's a comment on the screen. Is gas also an excuse that those with the desire for gear but not the five, wait, I can't see that from But here. not the money. So is gear acquisition, acquisition syndrome also an excuse for those with the desire for gear, but not the money used to not create? Oh yeah, same thing happens there. I think the, the interesting thing that, that there's, so there's a psychological thing of clutter. Clutter kind of stifles creativity, first of all, in and of itself. But there's also this, the concept that I've kind of noticed, at least for myself, is that when I have fewer choices, I have to get more creative. It's, it almost pushes me to be more creative and come up with ways to solve particular problems, to shoot something that I want to shoot or record something that I want to record. And, and I think that's actually really instructive. I, I have a comment about that too. Yeah. Um, I have known several people in 
music circles who have been like, oh, if I only had a better instrument, I would sound better. And that's one of the biggest fallacies there is. So I think that sometimes working with what you have can actually make you a better creative, give you better skills so that when you are able to expand your gear choices, you'll understand better how to use them to their full potential. Um, It's kind of like um, learning to drive it for those of us who ha- know how to drive a manual transmission or even have access to one because those are pretty rare now. In um, the US, they're rare. In, in the U.S., right, <laughs> right. Actually, yeah. So uh, I learned to drive on a Chevy Cavalier that had a really kind of hard, difficult clutch with a really long throw. Mm-hmm. And so mastering that which was not the easiest thing uh actually made it easier when we got a car that had a better easier to use clutch so uh, that's a little analogy for that yeah good all right um so those are so those are some oh Oh, you have have more you have more Uh, okay so there's but then on the flip side of that um there are these awful instruments that i that I have heard call and that I use this term too, VSOs or violin shaped objects. So I don't mean to say that you need to try um, to make trash gear work because that actually can also hamper skill building and creativity. So you need to find, you know, something that is actually functional and that will work, but it doesn't actually have to be like the spiffiest thing out there. Like you don't need a Stradivarius to make a nice sound. Agreed. And I and I think I think to that point as well, I think it's okay over time as you progress in your craft, whatever it is, musician, filmmaking, sound mixer, recorderist. Um, I think it's okay to upgrade, but I think you need to get rid of some things too. So you don't end up with a lot of clutter. Again, okay to have backup and things like that, obviously. But if you start having too many, I like, for example, five, I think needs to go down to at least four cameras realistically and and there's these people are they're both smiling at me right now kind of like ha 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 yeah that's cute but i mean we'd use all of those cameras for when we when we're making when we're making courses see here's the where the justification starts slipping in and it's dangerous um i think i can definitely say that five is too many um i think four is realistic for what i need to do but others may have other perspectives as well you have to decide for yourself but what i'm saying is that if, if it comes time where you where your craft has gotten to a point where it makes sense for you to buy maybe a $1,200 or an $1,800 microphone and maybe not use your $200 shotgun microphone anymore, I think that's okay. I think it's okay to upgrade, um, but I think you need to have a strategy for how to manage it and, and what to do with the old one. It could become a backup for you. Um, it could become the second mic that you use for interviews. It could become... You know, there are a lot of different possibilities, but once what, what, what happens when you get four? Now you have four shotgun microphones. Do you really need four? Or when you have six, do you really need six? You know, you have to ask yourself those questions and start determining when it's time to start either selling off or giving away those microphones or whatever it is that you don't need anymore. I have a question for you. Yeah. How do you feel about uh, when those around you maybe notice patterns of gear acquisition that may not be helping you? Like, do you, how do you feel when people like me uh, bring that up? Like, is that helpful in the long run, even though it may be, I don't know, irritating or annoying in the short term? Yeah, well, I've been asked a, a few times, how many microphones do you own? And my answer is, I don't really know. <laughs> However, um, we actually do know now. Um, we, we went and did some inventory. So we inventoried it. That's another thing you can do too. And that serves a a few purposes. So number one, insurance, you need to have an inventory of what you own. Um, and I'm speaking about this from the context of either a business or an individual. Um, if you're getting to a point where you can't answer that question, it's probably time, it's probably past time to inventory. So I think that's one thing is having an inventory. That wasn't the question though. Okay. Keep going. Okay. The question was, um, Yes. Oh, the answer is yes. It is helpful. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, you don't want to become an annoyance to people, but I haven't felt that way. It's usually said with a smile, and I'm usually laughing when you say it. So. (laughs) All right. So I think my point here is that if you are in a supportive position of a person who may be showing signs of gear acquisition syndrome, uh, 
don't be afraid to bring up any concerns or questions that you have about it because that might help the person think about it a little more. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Uh, we got another comment here from Mike. There's also a lot of gear snobbery around. Quote, you can't possibly call yourself a pro unless you have an X. Yes, that is in the music world too. Yes, I agree. I think you I, can... I would say ignore them. Ignore that. Yeah, it doesn't... <laughs> that's not helpful because, you know, in that whole pro versus amateur or, you know, whatever... I mean, I really struggle a lot of times when people ask, is this a pro piece of gear? And it's like, well, I mean, do pros use it? Yeah, I know plenty of pros who work on, you know, that that work in the film industry as production sound mixers who own a mix pre. Do they use the mix pre for their, you know, day to day work when they're working on large budget productions? No, not generally, maybe for collecting sound effects or something like that. So is that a pro piece of gear? I don't know. I know, you know, it's hard to answer those kind of questions. I think really what it comes down to, does it accomplish what you need it to accomplish? And um, that's that's the real question. So, and, and, and a lot of times that's not, that distinction too, is that when you start talking about pro gear, sometimes it's not just about audio quality. Like if we put it in the context of our discussion here, um, does a mix pre... Or, or does the sound device's 888 sound better than a sound device's mix pre? I don't, I don't know. I think if you listen really, really carefully, I think you're going to notice some differences. But are most audiences going to notice a difference? No. What makes the 888 more professional than a than a mix pre? Well, it has a lot to do with a, a lot of the things that professionals need to deliver on set that a mix pre can't easily do. So if I need to run a whole bunch of different feeds to different groups, I have to have a a wireless feed, I have to have a comm system for the sound department, I have to have a feed over to Video Village for the director and the script supervisor. That's where an 888 makes a lot more sense because you can do all those things. With a mix pre, you get one 3.5 millimeter output. It's going to be really tough to feed all of what you need to feed around set with something like that. So it's not just sound quality, it's other things as well. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Tools, they're tools. They are tools. Yeah. Yeah in our creative pursuit. Okay, anything else that we need to cover? Anything else in the chat needs to come up? Anything else you wanted to add? I think that's most of what I had in mind. Okay, thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, thanks for having me on. Everybody have a great afternoon, evening, morning, whatever time it is where you are. <laughs> All right, we're going to transition. If you give us just a second here, we'll get uh, the mic situation worked out. And one second. All right, thanks. Lots of interesting mm -hmm. All right. Thanks to Danny for joining us here today. Um, okay. What do we got next on? Wait, don't don't go there yet. Let's go. <laughs> I'm using an iPad for two separate things, and that might be a problem. Uh, but actually, it's it's no big deal. We can do it. Okay. Let's go into our question and answer for today. So, uh, first up, what's the minimum amount of wireless channels or systems you'd say customers should be allowed to expect to be included in a basic sound pack? including camera hops and feeds for director, producer, scripties? This is a question from Philip. Fine question, Philip. I would say zero, absolutely zero there. Um, you should be charging for everything that is needed for the production. That is how, that's how it works. I mean, you can't... Um, so, so I think there are two separate questions here, and, I'm not, and I want to make sure I cover both of them. Number one, I think they should include nothing for free um, as part of your day rate. That's a separate thing. So... <clears throat> Um, there's that. The kit should always cover all of the, the gear that you're going to use. And so now there's a separate question. How many wireless channels should I have, kind of, the, should I own so that I can really kind of be ready to do jobs? You know, if I get a call one day and I have to be there later that day or that the next day, um, my take is, is I you have to have at least two channels of wireless. And this is really going to depend on the types of jobs you're doing as well. I've now upped that to four channels for me. Um, and then... You know, anything beyond that, as long as there's prior planning, then you can usually arrange to get the additional channels. So, and that's going to be borrowing from friends, borrowing from fellow production mixers, uh, renting from a rental house, whatever the case may be. So that's my, that's kind of my take on how that should work, Philip. But you should always, you should have um, basically work up, a, go through your entire kit and I would put a price on everything that needs to be included. So you could say the base, you, you could say for yourself, the base includes two channels of wireless plus my mixer, plus all the batteries and all the cabling 
the boom mic, the boom pole, you know, just your basic kit, whatever that happens to be in your case, and then put a price on that and then get um, individual prices, just develop individual prices for anything addition to the, in addition to that that a, that a potential client wants or needs. So that's how I would approach that, and that's how I do it generally. So here in the Salt Lake area, I'm almost always doing half day jobs if I'm if I'm actually hiring out for that. So a lot of times that that kit fee or you know that kit rental fee is going to come in somewhere between I mean it's at least 250 for a super simple job and then it's going to go up from there. So that's the main that's kind of the thinking. And the idea of what you want to build in there is you know you're you're putting wear and tear on your gear every time you use it. So it is a it is the price to pay for replacing and maintaining your existing gear. Lavalier microphones um, get beat up pretty badly, pretty quickly. So I've found that over and over again on sets. <laughs> you know, an actor will come out and say, "Hey, look, here's your here's your kit, your wireless kit," and they're holding it by the lavalier mic with the transmitter <laughs> dangling it, like it, not intentionally necessarily, but whoa, oh, sorry, here here it is. Or they uh, tried to help you out by winding up the cable for the lav mic on their own, and they just kind of basically knotted it up and made a mess out of it, which can damage the microphone cable, and then you have to replace, you know, so on and so forth. So take all that into account, and that's part of your kit fee. So thanks for the question, Philip. It's a very, very good one. Next up from Richard, how would you rate the Canon C70 audio preamps against the MixPre 2 series audio recorder, for instance? Would you use the C70 audio for professional corporate video? So here's a great example. I've had this camera, the Canon C70, um, which is a fantastic camera. I've had it since November of last year. And um, it was actually purchased to be the new live stream camera, to be honest. <laughs> we haven't used it for a single new live stream yet. Um, and it's it's been basically lack of time and all the other commitments that we have. So I have not tested the, the short way to just, again, like, jump to the question. The short answer is no, I don't know. I haven't tested them yet. The problem that I have with these is the kind of thing that it's a little bit of a pain, but is you know, potentially advantageous. I guess you can't see it, but you basically have the TA3F connectors. Those are the inputs. So they're the mini connectors and they're a little bit more work because then you have to usually adapt them from whatever you're using. So um, I could see, yes, on a very simple shoot, if I had to go in and just do a, a quick talking head type of thing, corporate, um, yeah, I could see doing that. Bring the adapter cable, and yeah, it would be a pretty simple, straightforward thing. As soon as you get two people, I think there's an advantage to the mix pre putting aside the question of the quality of the preamps. As soon as you get over to two people, then you're you're looking at something where an auto mix might be something that's really, really helpful to help turn around time. So that's something that the mix pre has that the Canon C70 or any other camera will not have. So those are some things to take into account. So um, I my experience with the with the Canon Cinema Line preamps is that they're pretty decent. If you have a microphone that needs a lot of gain, like a dynamic microphone, then you're going to be pushing them there. But if you're using a good condenser microphone, usually they're going to be fine. So my take is, I guess, the short answer then is yes, I would use it for a professional corporate video. Um, would it be my typical kit? No, I'd probably bring a Mix Pre or my 88, um, especially if I'm going to be recording more than one person. So it is a good question, though, and uh, thanks for that, Richard. I, this is a good example of where too much gear is a problem. All right, next up from Tom. How to ensure an export from Final Cut Pro to Resolve keeps the audio in a form that one can work efficiently with in Resolve Fairlight? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, have, I do have some thoughts on this. Final Cut Pro 10, this is pure opinion, people. This is my take on it. I am a Final Cut Pro 10 editor. I do 99% of my video editing in Final Cut Pro 10. I love it for video editing. I can edit faster. I make fewer mistakes with it. Um, I used to be a Premiere Pro editor. I have edited also a little bit in uh, Resolve, um, but I just keep going back to Final Cut Pro 10 for editing. I love it for editing. It is horrible from my point of view as a soundie. It's horrible for mixing. I dislike it immensely for mixing <laughs> and getting it in and out of Final Cut Pro 10 um, to get it over into another app has been problematic as well. However, there are a few things. And so let's go ahead and switch over to the Mac and let me just talk through a few things here really quickly. First of all, if just in the broader context of talking about getting audio 
from a video edit into a digital audio workstation. At least in the pro world, and here there's that word again, which is again, makes me a little bit nervous. I don't like to use it, but if you're talking about big, big budget at least pro productions, they're almost always doing their mix in Pro Tools, for better or worse. And in fact, Tom talks a little bit about Pro Tools as well here. But when you're when you're working in that world, the interchange formats that you need to be aware of are called AAF and OMF. OMF is the older, um, more used standard, I guess. I. I I, I'm not sure standard's the right word, but it's the most commonly used in the old days. Nowadays, AAF is the more common. You'll still see some OMFs out there, but more and more you're going to see AAF. These are interchange formats. They're basically XML definitions that allow a video editing app to um, specify what needs to be specified to get the audio mix over into Pro Tools or another digital audio workstation. So that's the first thing. I would definitely, I put some links for the articles here. Here's a really good one from Pro Tools Expert. This one's kind of cool because they brought in, um, first of all, they talk about what an AAF is and what an OMF is and what the difference is between them. And then they talk uh, to a variety of different sound post people. In fact, Lucy Mitchell, I follow over on Twitter. Um, Anyway, these they, they each have they ask them a variety of questions about these interchange formats and what their experience has been with them. So it's really instructive. So I would definitely recommend taking a look at that one. And then there are two others that were both written by um, April Tucker, who does some post sound as well. She's in the Los Angeles area, and here she talks very specifically about what an OMF is and an AAF is, and you know why you need to know about them, and what the advantages of one over the other. In short. AAF will bring more metadata over and make the process a little bit easier for you. So it'll bring track names. It will bring um, some of your automation that has been done in the edit. So for example, if someone has been writing the fader on one of the tracks to maybe pull it back a little bit, that should come over in an AAF where you wouldn't necessarily get that in an OMF. And then she also has another article over on soundgirls.org, again, talking about the two, the difference between OMF and AAF and why it matters and, and what you need to know about each of them. So again, it's all in the context of bringing things over into, as you can see here, Pro Tools. Um, now, specifically about Final Cut. So some of my experience, I and Tom, to answer your question shortly or quickly, I don't have experience doing all of this. So I don't know the answer, but I'm just trying to give you some resources to kind of track something down that's going to work well for you. The problem with Final Cut Pro 10 is that, and, and the benefit of Final Cut Pro 10 from an editing standpoint, is that it is a basically a trackless model. You have lanes instead of tracks. And what that means in practical terms is that your audio can end up all over the place. And that doesn't work when you're coming into a track-based model like any digital audio workstation. So it's the, the process of getting from one to the other is always challenging. The, the cleanest I've seen is if you work in Final Cut Pro 10 and you actually assign all of your audio tracks to an audio roll, then when you bring that over into final into sorry logic, that's the cleanest I've seen ever. <laughs> um, but I have not seen anything cleaner than that in any other app whatsoever. So I can tell you, for example, here um, for Final Cut. Let me just make this a little bigger here, so you can see it. Um, I have used on a variety of occasions this X to CC. So if I, if the edit was done in Final Cut Pro 10 and I was going to do the mix in Adobe Audition. I use this app here. So basically I got a, FX, a Final Cut Pro XML export from Final Cut Pro. I then ran it through this app here that put it into a format that Adobe Audition could read, and then I imported that. So that's the best I've had there. Um, and then here's another one that goes the other, well, this one goes from Premiere Pro. If you wanted to get your Premiere Pro project into Final Cut, you could use something like this, but there are a variety of tools out here. This one's from Intelligent Assistance. So that is, um, those are some things to consider there. So you also asked what's the best round trip audio to and from Final Cut Pro 10 and Resolve to Pro Tools, including bringing audio back into the respective NLE. So um, a lot of times, I mean, you, you, the nice thing about bringing things back is that that's usually, that can be pretty easy. Um, what you can do in that case is you just bounce your entire mix and hand that over to editorial and they can put that into whatever app, whatever nonlinear editor app they have. So that's easy. They just have to mute all of the original audio and then they've got the final mix and they're good to go. So that's the easy part. The hard part is getting over to your app. Now, so when I did use this X to CC app, I, let me just say that 
Um, I even when I had access to the Final Cut Pro 10 project and I could assign roles, it still just made an absolute mess. Audio was you know spread across you know in a in a I, this is a, a I'm thinking back to a trailer that I mixed that was cut in Final Cut and I mixed in Adobe Audition. Um, I think on the when I after I used X to CC to get it into Adobe Audition, I ended up with something like 60 tracks of audio that I had dialogue place. I had music. It had split it up, so instead of it being stereo, it was on two mono tracks. So there's there's really just a lot of cleanup to do at the very start, getting everything organized. And that was the very first step. So um, unfortunately, Final Cut is just not a great player in that role, <laughs> for better or worse. And I think, to be honest, I think from my point of view, that's a part of a big part of why it's not used on the big budget films in Hollywood is that, I mean, it's been used on a few, but it just doesn't fit the workflow very well. So it's sad, but that's been my experience. So uh, I don't know if anyone else has another perspective on that. We'd love to hear it. So if you do, definitely let us know in the chat. Okay, let's take a look at our next question. Thanks for that, Tom. Next up is from Joe. Um, here's a question that I don't know the answer to, Joe, but thanks for submitting it. And perhaps at some point we can bring Michael Wynn on, who knows a little bit more about RF theory and can talk about this. But his here's Joe's question. My consumer grade 2.4 gigahertz wireless mic kit seems insensitive to physical orientation. At max, good reception, separation distance, the transmitter and receiver cases can be rotated or tilted or turned without causing a dropout. And I would like to understand how this was achieved. Perhaps a design feature, possibly with a 2.4 gigahertz band where the manufacturers can install a very short wavelength antenna surfaces surrounding the electronics and thus eliminate the sensitivity to case orientation? I don't know. That's a great question, Joe. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. It may be something inherent to 2.4 gigahertz. What I can tell you is, of course, and I think you've probably experienced too, any of you that have used the 2.4 gigahertz consumer wireless systems, um, they are very sensitive to barriers. So if you have a barrier in the way, that's where they tend to fall apart. But if you have a direct line of sight, they tend to do pretty well. So someday when we bring Michael back on, once he's uh, wrapped down some of his uh, current projects and uh, we can bring him back on the show, we will talk about that and see if he knows but I don't know offhand. So, all right. I think that's all the questions we have. What I would like to do is I did get some questions or not questions, actually, yeah, questions, but they were from the courses. Um, I want to bring up, let's see, I've got it right here. Okay, so let's go back over to the Mac. I have uh, an app here. So here's the problem. So the problem is that some people that are using the Mix Pre as an audio interface have had trouble setting it up on a, on a Mac. And people have actually asked me about it on a PC as well. So I have in my queue a to-do item to figure out how to, to set up the ASIO drivers on Windows to, to allow multi-track mixing uh, when you're using the Mix Pre as an audio interface. So that's a, that's a to-do for me. But let me just cover what I do know here as far as the setup on the Mac side. Take a drink of water here. Okay. <clears throat> A couple of things. First of all, in your Mix Pre, and I don't have the overhead camera right now, so I'll just describe this. You go to the settings, or the, sorry, the system menu, and you make the US, make sure the USB-C setting is set to audio. Once you've done that, you come to your Mac and you open this app right here, which is called Audio, oops, Audio MIDI Setup. Okay, that opens this app here. I wish I could make it bigger, but we tried last night and it you can make it bigger, <laughs> but none of the elements get bigger. You then would kill, uh, click on Mix Pre 3 over here in the left-hand corner or in whatever Mix Pre you're using. Now you have an input tab and an output tab. The big thing is you just want to check on the input tab and change that to the format you want to work in. So first of all, how many inputs you want, what bit rate, or sorry, bit depth you want to use, and also which sample rate. So the top section here is 44.1. I'd typically work in 48. I would want four channel, 24 bit integer. Select that. Now I will have available in my digital audio workstation four different channels from my Mix Pre 3. It only has three channels, so you'll only be able to access three of them, but that's how you would make them all available to the operating system. And then as far as output is concerned, um, here I would probably just change this to two channel, 24 bit, and then it will play that back from the Mix Pre. So that's really all you need to do. Now, if you're trying to do 32-bit float, you have to change your Mix Pre into 32-bit mode 
Let me just do that really quickly here. I'm going to system menu. No, sorry. I'm going to the record menu. And I'm going to change the sample rate to 32-bit float. Okay. The unit is going to restart. So I'm actually going to close this app and we'll come back in. There's the audio MIDI setup. When I come back in, there's my mix pre. You will see, does it have, it does now have 32-bit float available as well. So I can change it now if I wanted to do 32-bit float. I can do four channel 32-bit float 48 kilohertz right there. Uh, went. Oh, it went to the output. Okay, back to the input. So, so that's how you would go about setting that up. So if you're having trouble with your mix pre and getting it working as an audio interface, that's how you set it up on a Mac. And we'll be back with, uh, I'm going to have to get an education on how to do that on Windows. I don't know. I haven't used Windows for audio recording for years, years and years. So I'm going to have to do some, some work there. All right, uh, let's go... I guess we can do our giveaway. So let's talk about what we have to give away. Um, Emma is going to actually describe some things here, but let me just first show you what we have here. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna show. Uh, we have two microphones to give away. These are microphones that are, have been neglected, which is why they're being given away. To I want them to go to a home where you will use them. First of all, we have a Rode NTG2 shotgun microphone. I wanna make a warning about this microphone. It is a fine microphone. However, it does need a preamplifier with quite a bit of gain. If your if your amplifier does not if preamp does not supply at least 60 dB of gain, you probably don't want this one. <laughs> um, but it is a fine microphone. You can also battery power it if for whatever reason you needed to do that. Um, so it has that slot there, and um, it's not in perfect shape. It does have a piece of tape down here at the bottom because the sticker that had the serial number on it started peeling off. <laughs> So anyway, there it is. It's a, uh, it's my, it was my very first shotgun microphone. I don't use it, so it needs to go to a good home. It does come with the, the pouch, the foam cover, and a, just a microphone stand clip right here. So that's the first one, and then we have one more microphone. I want to get out here. This is actually an interview, like a handheld interview mic. It's an Electro Voice RE50L. Comes in this sort of nylon pouch. Um, it, the L stands for a longer handle, so it has a slightly longer handle. Um, it's an omnidirectional dynamic microphone, which is kind of interesting. So the nice thing about this as an interview microphone is that you don't, like a cardioid, you typically have to aim it pretty well, like if you were doing just a walk-up interview. Um, and that can, be, that can be a little bit problematic. With an omni, you generally just need to move it a little closer. Aim is not as important as how close it is. And so I've used this on to do interviews on the show floor at NAB. It's worked very, very nicely. Um, but I have another interview, at least one or two other interview mics, so I don't need a third one. Uh, it does come with a clip, uh, just a regular stand clip as well if you need that. And that's what we have. So let's go ahead and open up Emma's mic so she can tell you a little bit about how we're going to do this. Just some instructions here real quick. Okay. So basically, I used to type this in the chat, but y'all wouldn't listen to me, and then you would just start throwing numbers, so I'm going to say it first. Um, this is just kind of how it works. So I will put in the chat a little message that says, start numbers for X item here, and at that point you can put a number 1 through 50, one guess per person per item. Uh, Swiss Smith asked, I think, can you guess if you've already won stuff? Yes, but consider our talk that we just had about gear acquisition. We're not going to stop you but think about it first um, and if you are a winner which we will determine by seeing whose number was closest to the random number we're going to generate which we will show you um, we want you to email curtis at learnlightandsound.com that's your prize claiming method i guess yeah good luck uh, we, we should also say um and then the idea is that you'll pay for shipping we just use u.s postal service um we're finding that that's actually probably the most economical way to get these to you it's not fast so if you need something quickly this is probably not you know we can't promise we can get it to you super fast um emma's a full-time student i've got a day job so we'll do our best to get things quickly but we <laughs> the last round we just ended up getting those out on what wednesday or thursday oh, that was Monday. well we didn't actually ship them though until on tuesday. oh is it tuesday allow one oh. business day for processing. 
and we'll send them. Allow what? One business day for processing. <laughs> we'll send them the next day. That's it. <laughs> All right. So let's do this. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and generate a random number. And did you put the thing in the chat? Not yet. This okay. Is for Rode this is for the Rode NTG2 shotgun microphone. Again, you're going to need a pretty, pretty decent preamp to make this one work. Something with, I would say, 60 dB of gain. It's really what you're looking at. Woohoo. Watch this one. Okay. So we've got some. You guys, I this is this is I I hope a win-win for those of you that don't have the you know the money for buying mics like this. I hope this is a good thing for you. It's good for me because this one's not getting used here, so we want it to go to a home that it is being used. Can you guys hear that wind out there? It's just screaming out there. <laughs> All right, Are we still going? Yes, we're still going. Okay. Reminder that it's between 1 and 50. Yeah, between, guess your number needs to be between 1 and 50. Looking at you, Bill Smith. So, Bill, if you want to do another guess that's between 1 and 50, that would be awesome. And um, Emma's going to close it here in just a moment. Okay, that's it. Okay, so if you want to switch over to the Mac, you can see what the number was. We generated a random number. It was 45. Just for those that are curious, if you haven't been here for one of these before, random.org uses environmental noise to seed its random number generator. So it's appropriate for a sound for video session. <laughs> and Emma's looking through the chat right now to see who got closest there. We might need to do a runoff, so don't go far. If you did bid, taking a, a look. We have a 44. That looks like that's it. That looks like the one. You want to put them up on screen? He's on. Hold up. There we go. There we go. Val Neekman, if you want to email me, email me, Curtis at learnlightandsound.com. The Rode NTG2 is yours. Congratulations. Happy recording. Make some great stuff with it. Um, should do a good job for you. All right. Excellent. Next up, the interview mic from Electro Voice. This is a classic. Um, I'm going to generate a random number again. It's between 1 and 50, and Emma will let you know when it's time to start bidding. Right there. Okay, right now, start bidding. This is for the Electrovoice RE50, and we have generated our random number. Um, this one's this one's been an NAB <laughs> and interviewed people like um, I believe we interviewed Paul Isaacs from Sound Devices with this. We who else? Uh, Ted Sim from Aperture was interviewed with this as well. Kind of wish I was there. NAB? Yeah. Like you I've should, never been. Well, you should come next time. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be fun. Um, yeah, solid mic. Very well built, as you would expect from Electro Voice. Okay, are we still going? Mm -hmm. We are going. Okay, again, number between one and fifty. Um, you might you might also ask why do you charge? Why do I charge you for the shipping? Here's the dirty little secret on that. I we could pay it if we if we needed to, but I want you to have skin in the game. So I don't want people to just take something free that they don't really need. The idea is that you have thought about it. And you're a little bit invested. That's the main idea. If you really can't afford it, just and you win, let me know, and we'll work something out. So, all right, our random number was 16. Looks like the bidding for that one's closed. Ooh, there is a 16. There's a 16. Let me see if there's another 16. We're going to see if there's another one. Okay, was it just one? Just one. Just one, okay. Let me find it again. Number 16. It it's from Marco. So Marco, congratulations on the new microphone. It's the Electrovoice RE50L. If you would please email me, curtis at learnlightandsound.com, and we will get the, you know, we'll make arrangements to uh, for the shipping, and we should be good from there. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for making the world a better sounding place, and... All right, let's uh, let's go to the chat and see if we have anything that people want to talk about there. 
Uh, I mentioned Paul Isaac's name, and that deviled the value. <laughs> That's right. Um, our cele celebrity product manager, product director, Paul Isaacs, was interviewed with this mic. Also, Ted Sim from Aperture, if you're into that, uh, has been interviewed, and there are a variety of other people as well. Um, oh, yeah, Rob, um, what's his name? Ryan Burke from um, Rode was also interviewed with this. <laughs> Man, it'll only let me go so far back in the chat. There were some good comments about gear. Thank you to everybody who commented about gear and uh, put opinions into that conversation. That was an important one. Thank you. But we lost some of the history on the chat available to put up on screen. So if you did have, uh, I wish there, wish we still had some of that. Um, anyway, we're, well, if you do have any questions, go ahead and put at Curtis Judd Audio, and that'll make it a little easier for us to find it. But if you've got a question, Go ahead and put that in the chat as well. Thanks for the discussion earlier on. I um, I love live streaming because it's it's a lot more interactive, but it's hard for me to <laughs> to catch all the chats, and we we're doing our best here. But um, anyway, go ahead and put your questions in there, and we'll take a look at those. So first from Tim here, what's the going day rate for equipment? Say for a mix pre ten to a couple of nice condenser mics and all necessary cables and stands, etc. Is day rate better, easier than hourly? Well, usually um, for freelance work, I've been hired on a day basis, so that's just the easiest way for me to price it. And I think for me, the, the least expensive is generally about 250 but um, a lot of times the production will require more than that. So that for me is just going to be, um, that'll be my 888 a boom, and a boom mic, basically, maybe one channel of wireless, and that, that's basically what that is. Um, if, if I need any more channels of wireless, and almost always we will need more than that, that's where the price starts going up. Also, if they if the production needs um, wireless hops to camera, which I've actually never had to do um, on the productions I've worked on, usually what I do need is they want um, wireless audio for the for producers and or the director. So usually I have to price that in as well. I have a, I have a kit of two different Comtechs, so I've got two Comtech receivers, so I can I can do two. Um, just with the stuff I own, but if I need more than that, then I have to arrange. I've never needed more than that. I'm working in a pretty small market here where we're not doing a ton of stuff, and I'm extraordinarily busy with my day job and other stuff, so I don't do a lot of that anyway. But that those are the main things there, um, and that's just how I price it here in this market. So hopefully that's uh, helpful for a start. Now, I will say also, just to kind of wrap up on that question that you didn't ask specifically, but day rates vary pretty wildly widely based on your market um, it'll be very different from market to market there just so that's uh clear there <laughs> uh, vishal anyone know a good lav mic for my iphone please sound off in the chat that's a world that i haven't operated in in a long time um the last decent one that i've used was the deity v dot v lav i think it's called um, that one was pretty decent, and I think it's about 35 bucks, if I'm not mistaken. So that one's worth a look. And if anyone else has other recommendations, definitely let us know in the chat here. Okay, from Dean. Can we see your setup for today? Um, I don't really have a camera for today, but it's it hasn't changed substantially from... Let's see, what was it? When did we do the behind-the-scenes with the new mix, with the new... Um, switcher like beginning of january beginning of january okay yeah so back to beginning of january we'll probably come back and do that again but just to run through it really quickly so main camera here is well switcher which is kind of the the, the brain of the whole thing <laughs> is an atem a black magic design atem 2me rack mount mixer or switcher which is actually out in a rolling rack mount cart outside of the door here um as far as cameras, we are running a Canon C200 as our main camera. We have a Mac that's feeding one of our one of the inputs. We've got a, an iPad that's feeding an input. Um, we have a laptop that's feeding the chat that you're seeing, so we're keying that. That's another input. Then we have the uh, advanced panel that Emma is using to do the switching. As far as audio is concerned, I'm using an Earthworks SR314 here. I was using a Shure MV7 a little earlier. As our second mic, Emma's using the Shure KSM-8 dynamic microphone. And that's all coming into a... I don't know if I can pull that in the frame here. It's too... Uh, sort of. 
That's an Allen and Heath SQ5 mixer, and I can actually control that. I've been controlling that from my iPad if you want to switch to that. So I can actually control all of that here. So you can see right now I've got the SR314, that's what I'm talking into. We've got the MB7, which I was talking into earlier, Emma's KSM8. We've got the phone over here on channel 5. Um, we've also got a full complement of effects for each of the different inputs here. So for example, you can see I'm using a compressor, just sort of tickling, not doing a whole lot of work, but just a little bit there. Um, we've got a little bit of EQ as well to handle sibilance a little bit, uh, high pass filter, so on and so forth. So that's the audio setup that is actually feeding. Um, actually, let me before I switch off, you can see here, um, this is the output right here, the main mix. I have a 133 millisecond delay programmed in, and that is so that the audio comes back in sync or comes into the switcher in sync with the camera. So I'm actually feeding the output of the mixer into the ATEM switcher. And that's why we apply this delay here so that everything's in sync when I talk. <laughs> uh, what else did I miss? Uh, we are so, and then out output from the ATEM switcher is going into a Tascam VSR265, which is a hardware encoder. And that's sending the stream over to YouTube. So that's our, I think I've covered everything in our setup. Oh, in terms of monitoring, Emma's monitoring, we have a, the output, there's balanced outputs from the switcher. That's coming into a little labs monitor which is a, just a little um, headphone amp, basically. It, it has other purposes too, but that we're using it for that today. Um, I think that covers every, well, in between the cameras or and the laptops or computers, we do have some decimator cross converters. So we had to, you have to kind of get HDMI to SDI to get it into the switcher. So we're using those as well. All right, next question. Next up, I'm curious, what's your thoughts on the Cedar SDNX plugin versus Noise Assist plugin from both, uh, both from Sound Devices? Um, yeah, so th those that uh, weren't aware, um, the company that makes Cedar DNS, Denoise, which is a hardware denoiser, um, have also partnered up with Sound Devices, and now they have a software plugin version for the 8 series recorder. So that's going to be the 833, 888, and the Scorpio. Um, and so now, in addition to what Sound Devices already had, which was called their Noise Assist plugin, you can now also buy the Cedar SDNX, which is a denoising processor as well that'll be built into your mixer, but it costs money to license it. Um, <clears throat> I'll be honest, I haven't thought a lot about it. I know Cedar has had a longer history in the denoising world than Sound Devices has, so they probably, you know, I think the idea here is that just like with Sound Devices, where they have a Mix Assist plugin on their 8 series and 6 series, they've also featured um, Dugan auto mixing. So Dugan has been doing auto mixing. They, they approach it a different way. They have patents on their technology. And so I think it's a similar thing with Cedar, as they have, they kind of approach the whole thing, the whole process of denoising a little bit differently. They probably have some patents on some of their technology. And so essentially they've brought that over and made it available in the 8 series. I don't need a lot of denoising, to be honest, in most of the work I do. Um, so I haven't put a lot of thought into it. I don't have it. I don't have the, the Cedar DNX or SDNX, I guess I should say, plugins. And so I haven't tried them. Um, but if, if you're doing a lot of, I would think more like for news gathering, um, if you're doing a lot of recording of live events with panel discussions. So, you know, I have a friend actually, um, Ray Ortega went around for like, I think it was like eight months, he was following around a really big podcast where they would actually go into theaters and have an, a live audience while they recorded their pod podcast. And his job was, he was the engineer, he was the recording engineer. So he would work with the front of house engineer and make a recording. And I think in those circumstances, having um, maybe a denoising capability might be helpful. Automix certainly would be helpful. Um, and, and denoising might be helpful as well. But those kind of circumstances, I think, is where you're going to find it more useful. Um, I don't, for me, I don't do a lot of that type of work, so I haven't tried it yet. But if Sound Devices wants to give me a license, I'm happy to evaluate it. <laughs> All right. Cool thing about that, too, is I wouldn't be acquiring a new piece of gear. Uh, Swissmith, when will you start a podcast with General Gerald Undone and DSLR Video Shooter? Well... I need more time in my life. Um, I, I know both of them. I met both of them in person. Um, Caleb from DSLR Video Shooter and I met Gerald, both at uh, NAB. I met, I met 
Caleb actually several years ago. And then Gerald I met in 2019 there. I'd love to. They're both really intelligent guys. Um, I, I have nothing but respect for what they do. I'd love to do a podcast with them if they'd be game. I know Caleb's already on the Cameron Flask podcast, so he does that regularly. Um, I don't know. Need more time in my life. I need less day job and more time. <laughs> so someday when we get that. Uh, Emma is taking care of something in the chat here, it looks like. Okay. Got five more minutes here. Do you consider the triad orbit system a good C-stand alternative? Well, yes and no. Um, they're not nearly as tall as C-stands, but they are very well built. I, I've, um, In fact, I've been... <laughs> In the context of our earlier discussion about gear acquisition, um, I have not purchased a Triad Orbit. I have visited their booth at NAB a couple of times over the years. Um, the gear is fantastic. It's very well built. The problem is it's just not as tall and um, the boom arms aren't as long. So um, I think you could easily use one of their stands and the boom arm for seated interviews if they're pretty tightly cropped or not cropped, but framed. Um, something like this would probably work if you get much wider than this they're not they're just not going to be tall enough and have enough boom range on them unless they have bigger ones that I'm not aware of so that's been my experience I actually am <clears throat> in the context of our earlier discussion about gear acquisition I am I have some old I have two microphone stands dedicated like stage booms you know small microphone boom stands um, both from onstage stands they were $25 or maybe $30 and they're okay, but they're really kind of, they flop around a lot. Um, the fittings aren't all very tight. So um, at some point, I probably will give one of those or both of those away and, and probably invest in a Triad Orbit because I do have need for those types of stands still sometimes. But I think they're going to be hard in terms of actually booming mics out in lieu of a C stand. Be nice if we could, but they're... And they're actually not that, I don't think they're less expensive than the C-stand setup, to be honest, if you already have a boom pole. Um, but anyway, there's some, th some thoughts there on that. Uh, teacher, teachers, newbie question. Even though I export all my final projects with 48 kilohertz audio, is there an advantage during post-processing how, to having recorded 96 kilohertz? Um, potentially. For dialogue, I typically don't. I don't really see a, a huge advantage there. If you are doing sound effects, I think that's where there is an advantage. And that is if you have to resample or do some really heavy processing, I think that's where 96 kilohertz makes a little bit more sense. And I think a lot of the a lot of the sound effects you can buy nowadays um, from the various, you know, stock sites, a lot of them are recorded in 96 kilohertz. So for example, um, what's the fellow's name? Do you remember the book, The Location Sound Bible? Uh, Rick Veers. Rick Veers. Rick Veers actually sells, sells a whole bunch of packs and his all of his are recorded in 96 kilohertz i believe at least certainly all the more modern ones um so that's the main advantage the, the advantage there too is if you want to slow it down you can you can resample pretty easily to 48 kilohertz from 96 it's 48 is half of 96 so um, that works pretty nicely so i think sound effects is the biggest thing if you're doing a lot of heavy sound design and using a lot of sound effects that's where it's advantageous okay hey camille thanks so much and it's good to hear from you. Good to have you here. Thanks for your email earlier this week. All right. Off topic. What's your home stereo? Oh, that is off topic. <laughs> we were actually just complaining about that this morning. Um, so we do have a Harman Kardon. It's just a stereo receiver. Um, and we just have a couple of floor standing nuance or fluance, which is a fairly budget brand of, of speaker. Um, and they work well, I think. What? Why? Fairly budget brand. Fluance? Yeah, those are like 400 bucks. Oh. But they, what, do you, do you consider those premium? I don't know. Well, in the audiophile world, those are considered budget. Let's just say that. They're oh. fine. They, they, do you like them? Yeah. Yeah, I like them too. They sound great. Um, we use those for both just mu listening to music upstairs in the main room, you know, in the kitchen and the main area. And then we also use it when we watch a movie or anime. Well, we don't really watch anime, but we watched. We don't watch. Anime. We watched. We watched. Um, <laughs> what was it called? The last. The last Airbender. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's not easy. Avatar. That's 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 light super lightweight. <laughs> it's but it was good. I like that one. Uh, Ted says, any thoughts on a Rode SmartLav Plus? It suits my needs, but don't need pro audio. It's okay. SmartLav Plus. Um, I haven't, I've tested it years ago when it first came out. The Smart, they first came out with the SmartLav, which was their very first lav mic to plug into a phone. It, it produced a lot of self noise. The SmartLav Plus addressed that to a large extent. Um, it sounds pretty decent. I think you're going to need to do some EQ for most voices. Um, but yeah, I think it's a fine choice. It's probably, I would I would take a look at the Deity VLOV instead, potentially. I mean, there there are pluses and minuses. The nice thing about the Smart Love Plus, depending on your work, your use case, is that its cable is shorter. Um, but if you need a longer cable, then the Deity VLOV is a is a better choice. Also, the Smart Love doesn't have a battery. The VLOV does. It only uses its battery to figure out what it's plugged into, and then it basically turns off from there. So the battery will last a long time. Um, but those are kind of the pros and cons of the two. The, the well, and the Deity V Love is a lot less expensive than the Smart Love, unless they've repriced the Smart Love. So those are some thoughts there on that, Ted. All right, how about we make this our last one? Okay, because we got to go here. A10 Mini or Live Pro L1? Which way to jump? Um, I, Mike, I don't know what the Live Pro L1 is. I'm not familiar with it. Let's take a look. Live. Pro L1. It appear. Oh, that's the feel world, the new feel world. Okay. I would probably go with the ATEM, to be honest. I looked into this one. It has some cool features that the ATEM doesn't have. Um, I don't know if anyone's tested it yet, though. I'd be curious to know what anyone's experience was. When I read the specs, it was missing some things. Um, let me just take a look here. I'm trying to remember the audio, what the audio inputs were. It does have one audio input and one output, and then everything else is embedded in the HDMIs. Um, I can't remember if they actually have a live uh, multi-view output on this one. And I don't know if it has an encoder built in, or if it just streams via USB. It does have a an an RJ45 jack, but I don't know if you it actually has a, an encoder behind that or if that's just for control of the scene. But I guess the short version, Mike, I haven't tested it, so I don't know. Um, but it, for those that are that are not familiar, I guess it does have a T-bar. <laughs> that you'd be get, getting something that the ATEM doesn't have, the ATEM Mini doesn't have. Um, Fieldward, make, they make decent products. You do get a little mini screen. To me, it's just amazing that they packed all that into a $299 device. I don't know how they've done that. Um, so you get a, a kind of a preview of all of your sources there. And you have some effects and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I bet you Aaron Parecki will probably review that one. So I'd look to Aaron on that. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody, that uh, joined our... Oh, thanks for the skate fun. Hey, the skate fun. Thanks, Jason. Um, <laughs> Emma's stoked about that. She can't wait for the snow to all melt so that she can go outside skating. Um, thanks for joining us today. Get out there and make some great sound. For those that won one of these, definitely get over in touch with me at curtis at learnlightandsound.com. We'll be back with you next week. Take care, everybody.